Welcome to Convos from the Couch by Life Stance Health, where leading mental health professionals help guide you on your journey to a healthier, more fulfilling life. Hello, everyone. This is Convos from the Couch by Life Stance Health. I'm Nicolette Lianza, and in this episode, I'll be talking with Leanna Stockard, a clinician from one of our Life Stance New Hampshire offices, and she'll be telling us about ways to build intimacy in our relationships. So welcome, Leanna. Great to have you back on. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me back. This is such an important topic because we know that intimacy is essential to any healthy relationship but it can be much harder to build it than we even realize. So I really look forward to you sharing with us some of your tips on how to build it and maintain it in our relationships. So thank you again for being on. It's a topic I'm very excited to talk about. So I'm excited. And I know last time you were on, you told us a little bit about yourself then, but do you mind telling us a little bit more about yourself? Sure, of course. Um, So as you mentioned, I'm Leanna Stockard. Um, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, I'm currently licensed in Illinois, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. However, through Life Stance, I am based out of New Hampshire. Um, I've been practicing for over six years at this point. I work with individuals, couples, and families. Um, I have a, you know, a wide variety of you know different interests, um, but a little bit more uh, specific specialties, but, um, relationships and intimacy is definitely one of those. I'm very passionate about this. When I talk about this with couples that I work with, as well as the individuals that I work with too, that might be trying to grow their relationships, not even just with their partner, but with other people in their life as well. And I think that's a great point. You definitely come to this conversation with a lot of great experience. And I think as we have this conversation, some of it might feel like it's particular for our partners, but I think we're talking just in general too of maybe all the relationships that we can be in, be it our partners, our family members, our friends, you name it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, as we jump in, let's talk about what is intimacy and why is it important for a relationship? Yeah. So, um, Ultimately, the definition of intimacy is closeness or close familiarity or friendship with another person um, or persons. Um, So I think that having intimacy in a relationship is important because ultimately you're sharing, you know, parts of your life with the people in your life, um, especially with your partner. And it is important in order for us, it's important for us to increase vulnerability and gain closeness and connection with those people that you are sharing your life with. Otherwise, you know, it's likely to feel very surface level, kind of isolating, um, and maybe still feeling lonely, even when we have a lot of people around us. And I think you mentioned that vulnerability. I think that's one of the, and we'll probably maybe talk a little bit more as we go on here. I think a lot of people may might have a really difficult time with that vulnerability of allowing themselves to be vulnerable, to be open up to that intimacy as well. Absolutely. So as we're jumping in even more, how can people build intimacy either with their partners or in general? I don't know. Do you want to maybe if we just start with focusing just with their partner? What if we just start from that point of view? Yeah, that's great. Um, so as you just mentioned, uh, intimacy in general does take vulnerability. It's it's about sharing parts of yourself with another person. Um, so if we're feeling like kind of newbies with building intimacy, I like to recommend um, the five love languages. Um, so if we've heard about that before, um, the five love languages by Gary Chapman is, is a book um, that indicates how we um, express and receive love from other people. Um, So the five love languages are words of affirmation, quality time, physical touch, gift giving, and acts of service. And what those five love languages entail can definitely differ from person to person. And what the other person and what each person needs might differ person to person as well. Um, So I definitely think it's important that we, excuse me, we get in touch with our partner's love language and try to figure out like what aspect of our partner like really connects them to us. Um, I like to say, uh, not treat others the way that we want to be treated, but treat others the way that they want to be treated. Um, And I think that by learning their love languages, even if it feels uncomfortable for us and feels unnatural for us to maybe spend more quality time if we're a gift giver, um, trying to make that effort and doing that for your partner. 
Um, sorry, go ahead. I appreciate you mentioning the love languages because I think this is key. And I think a lot of people have heard of the love languages and those listeners who have now definitely check it out, Gary Chapman's book. I, and I love that you're emphasizing, you know, treat, how, treat others how they would like to be treated. I, I think with the love languages, if your own love language is acts of service, but your partner's is physical affection, then there might be a disconnect between the two of how you're communicating and expecting affection and things like that. So I, I really like the part that you're emphasizing this because this is one part that really does build intimacy. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and in addition to the love languages too, um, I, I share a lot with my couples that there there's three types of intimacy. So there's emotional intimacy, which is that closeness and connection on an emotional level. Um, you can build this by being in vul- You can be vulnerable, engaging in open and honest conversations um, and other other types of like emotional closeness that will help build some trust between you and your partner. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me. This can be done by either like connecting on your day to day, your deeper thoughts or feelings, or even, you know, talking about challenging times in your life and just being engaged and interested in what your partner has to say with that. Um, There's also physical intimacy, which is physical non-sexual touching with another person. Um, So this will go right alongside with like the physical touch love language. Um, So this is communicating to your partner um, what you are and are not comfortable with in terms of physical intimacy. So, you know, cuddling, holding hands, pet kisses, massages, foot rubs, you know, things of that sort. Like that's all the type of uh, physical intimacy. And then the last one is sexual intimacy. So that's consensual sexual experiences with your partner. Um, This is uh, this will also involve an element of emotional intimacy because you definitely need to be communicative and respect your partner in, the, in that type of way. And, you know, with that type of intimacy and closeness and understanding of your partner, you guys can, you know, work together to explore sexual preferences and make sure that our needs are being met in that way. Um, so those different forms of intimacy can differ from person to person, mm-hmm. like which one might be more important. Um, so it's just important to for us to connect with our partner and see how we feel about each of those intimacy um, I'm glad that you're bringing up that there are different types, because, again, I think for some people, they might not realize there's anything more than physical intimacy. So I really like that you're kind of dealing it out and separating it out a bit with the emotional, the physical and the sexual and emphasizing the physical is non-sexual, too, you know, Absolutely. so... Looking at what are some common barriers to intimacy in relationships and, and how can we overcome those? Yeah, so you mentioned this earlier, but uh, fear of being vulnerable with another person is absolutely a big one. Um, it's hard to be really intimate and close with them if we don't share like that deeper part of ourselves. Um, and we might have that fear of vulnerability due to a deeper fear of rejection or abandonment that if we are vulnerable, if we do share that part of ourself with somebody, they might not like me anymore and they might just leave. So it's, you know, that's a huge barrier. And those kind of go alongside with like the different types of attachment styles too, um, which can be just, which also can differ from person to person and is often created in childhood. So Um, you know, but those are all really big, excuse me, barriers to that intimacy, because we are just fearful of what could happen if we are intimate with somebody in a way that we're uncomfortable. Right, right, right. I think often when I think of vulnerability, I I can't think of vulnerability without thinking of Renee Brown. And I know she has like one of the biggest viewed TED talks on the power of vulnerability, but I think there's something to that. And it's very hard to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. I think it, it has to be a point of feeling emotionally safe with someone to allow yourself to be vulnerable. And I think that's probably a part of intimacy too, of just feeling emotionally safe with someone. Absolutely. And and I think it's important that people know that that can kind of be overcome in small steps, like working on slowly putting your guard down or slowly sharing parts of yourself um, to your partner um, to, you know, kind of just see, can I trust them with this and like see their response? Um, you know, people that may have been in past relationships where they were intimate or vulnerable, and then the person used that as like ammo against them in the mm-hmm. future, like you might be fearful. And so, you know, just taking that like step by step. And, you know, I like to say, 
tolerating mild forms of discomfort as opposed to like jumping right off the deep end. Um, but you know, okay. So I think I could feel okay sharing this thing that makes me a little uncomfortable, but I can tolerate that. And then as you continue to grow and learn with your partner, you know, that, that feeling of discomfort will become less and less throughout time. Um, <clears throat> that's a great tip. I, I never thought of just kind of testing the waters a bit and seeing what you can tolerate and doing a little bit more and more as you go along to mm-hmm. see. And I guess it sounds like what you're saying too, is that you'll be surprised by what you can tolerate when it comes to it. You'll get uh, used to the discomfort of it. Is that another absolutely. way to put it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, jumping right out of your comfort zone is really, really scary, but putting a toe outside of your comfort zone seems seems a little bit more tolerable. So yeah, taking it step by step is great. important. That's a great tip for sure. So how can couples, we're just talking specifically with couples here, maintain intimacy in a long-term relationship? Mm-hmm. I'm going to blanket statement and say, keep dating. Um, That's that is the biggest thing that I can recommend to long-term couples. I see this more often than not that couples just lose that part of them, uh, uh, lose that part of their relationship when, you know, you have a home together, you have kids together, you have like all, like all of these like individual pieces. And we, we don't go on dates anymore. We don't spend that quality time together anymore. And I think it's important too, like throughout, throughout that dating process is relearning who your partner is as we grow as people our needs our wants all of those are forms of intimacy that may all change and so as you're continuing to date your partner dating them in a way of like you know I know you foundationally but like I want to know you right now and um continue to have discussions about those needs and wants and get to know each other in other ways and even get to know each other in the ways that you think you already do know them I like that. That's actually really, really good. And I think for those who have really long-term relationships, forget that, that maybe who our partner was when we first started and we were together is maybe not, maybe they've grown and changed. We all hopefully grow and change and that they might be different and really understanding who that person is now and connecting with them and who they are today. It's great. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we can change even like day to day, something. Yeah something huge might happen to us in one day and it might change our outlook on something. It could change the way we feel about a certain thing. And if we just assume that we know these things about our partner without checking in or having these discussions, then we're just going to be on different pages, different books, even moving right. forward. Right. Good way to put it. Different books. Even, yeah, for sure. <laughs> absolutely. At Life Stands Health, we help people living with a variety of mental health conditions lead healthier, more fulfilling lives by improving Improving access to trusted and personalized mental health care. Our extensive network of licensed providers offer a wide variety of services to meet your needs and are ready to support you. At LifeStance, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to mental health. We offer both in-person and telehealth appointments so you get the care you need in the format that serves you best. Let's talk about what you need. LifeStance is here for you. Now, we know technology and social media can get in the way of, of some things. So my question to you is, you know, how can technology and social media impact intimacy and relationships? And, and then how can couples navigate that? Absolutely. So I have a lot of different thoughts on this. Um, I'll start off with the first one. Um, but social media specifically can be extremely challenging to navigate through. Um, social media is in my perspective, a highlight reel of people's lives. Very rarely. It's good, um, good way to put that, a highlight reel. That's actually yeah. a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like very rarely do people actually show like, and I'm just going to keep on this metaphor here, but behind the scenes of like what's actually going on with them. They're just going to post about like this exciting thing that happened or this beautiful sunset that they saw. And, you know, I, I give kudos to the people that do post like the, their raw behind the scenes things out there. Um, so that way we can like see that other people are human. Um, but when we do see others highlight reels, we might see, you know, couples going on vacations or like spending a lot of more like intimate time together. And 
what I can see happening from time to time is an insecurity can maybe build. Um, it might build like an impending sense of doom. Like my relationship is over. My relationship is not great. Look at what they're doing. They're out on this vacation, like having such a good time together. And I'm at home, you know, taking care of my kids and, you know, my partner, my partner barely talks to me like this is over, like, or maybe even as I kind of transition into the next part, like, maybe there's something better for me out there. And then they can start to like have that type of questioning, uh, which can unfortunately lead to a lot of traps that can be in social media, which is like direct messages from other people, ads of like other singles in your area, um, you know, increasing porn addictions and things of uh, all that sort, which can ultimately affect the intimacy with your partner because you're not as present with them. You're now looking outside and like looking elsewhere thinking that the grass is greener on the other side. Right. Which is a perfect setup for this next question is how can couples rebuild intimacy after experiencing a betrayal Absolutely. or a significant breach of trust even? Absolutely. So just kind of sticking along with the social media aspect of things, I think it's really important to make sure that you and your partner are honest about the limits, the boundaries, and what's deemed as acceptable and, un and unacceptable in the relationship. And if those things are crossed... Breaches of trust are incredibly difficult to work through because at the foundation of intimacy and vulnerability is trust. So if that trust is broken, it's very, very hard to heal from that. It's like a wound that like a really, really deep wound that we need stitches. We need like a cast. We need to peroxide it every day and it yeah. hurts and it takes a while to heal. Um, there's there's truly no easy way to build it back. Um, but the the time and like time and work that is needs to be dedicated to building that trust back definitely depends on the severity of the breach of trust and the partnership specifically. Um, and who the like I like to call like them the betrayer and then like the person that was betrayed. Um, but the person that was betrayed, what they need in order to build trust. Um, in my perspective, the person that broke the trust definitely needs to work a little bit harder mm -hmm. to build that trust back since they're the one that created that breach. Um, and so checking in with your partner, um, checking with your partner consistently about what their needs and wants are, um, making sure that the actions that need to be taken are on the same page, like whether that's deleting social media, deleting a person from your life, um, you know, some other small action steps with that. Um, but ultimately, too, the person that, you know, broke the trust needs to be willing to accept responsibility, showing remorse for that broken trust and making sure moving forward, we're engaging in that open and honest communication and even transparency. So sharing your phone, like sharing your passcodes, transparency, yeah, emails, mm -hmm. like full transparency. And I think, you know, that can be really hard for people because it's like an invasion of privacy. Right, but unfortunately, right. when that trust has been broken and it takes a while to heal it back up, mm -hmm. that privacy, you know, you utilize that privacy to do something behind your partner's back. And so that privacy is no longer like a privilege in a way, if right. that makes sense. Yes, that totally makes sense. And I think just overall, what I hear you saying is that it is possible to heal from a, a, a big breach of trust or a betrayal. It just, it's going to take a lot of work. It is. And in addition to that, it takes patience mm -hmm. and consistency. Um, I've worked with multiple couples that have come to me for breaches of trust, whether it's been, um, you know, flirting with somebody through text message to having multiple affairs to like having a completely different family and finances. Like mm -hmm. there, there's, I've worked with people that have had a wide variety of breaches of trust and it is definitely possible to heal from that and to, and for some folks to even be stronger um, coming out of it because yeah. we are in different books, perhaps this breach of trust as we build trust together again, and we are able to get to know each other, get to know each other's needs in a way we can almost like get back into the same book and start on the same chapter. Right. Right. Which is, that's the key. That's so critical right there. Yeah. I know you mentioned some ways for, you know, building the intimacy in long-term relationships. Can you give us some additional uh, ways that couples can continue to grow and deepen their intimacy over time? Yeah. As I mentioned, keep dating. Yeah, uh, that is a good one. 
Yeah. Continue to get to know each other. Um, ask them about like past stories you've never heard before. Like tell me about your third grade teacher or like, what was, um, what was your, what was your experience like coming home from middle school or, you know, things of that sort, like trying to just ask questions and stories Mm -hmm. of things that you may not already know about your partner. Also like play games with each other. Um, I I, like have fun, be playful Mm -hmm. with one another, try new things together. Uh, like I think taking risks together can be really, really important too, because it does allow us to build more trust with one another you know, being like jumping out of a plane together, like, Ooh, okay. So we just did that together. And like, that was really scary. And I trusted that, you know, my, uh, tandem person's shoot was going to go and I was going to be safe. So it helps just build trust to be able to take those types of risks together. Um, traveling together, uh, also exploring each other sexually in a way that you never have before, of course, consensually. Um, and then ultimately talking frequently with each other, talk about your challenges, your successes, Um, your day to day, your favorite coffee of the week, or, you know, whatever it might mean, Um, engaging in love languages, and ultimately, surprise your partner. Great tips. I I think it's really recognizing the habits you might fall into with your partner and and shaking it up a bit and and trying to see them from a different light and asking those questions that you think you might think you know everything about your partner, but you probably don't. So I love asking those questions about middle school and things like that, trying new things together. I, those are all really great tips. Oh my gosh, Yana, thank you. You just provided so many great tips on how to build the intimacy with our loved ones and those who are close to us. And I'm sure our listeners will probably take not even just one or two, but many of the examples you gave and hopefully start applying that to their own relationships. So thank you again for sharing all your knowledge with us. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. And like I said, I could, I absolutely love this topic and just for the listeners out there, like you, it's never too late to build that intimacy and it's never too late to build that trust. So. Thank you again, Leanna. Absolutely. Thank you. I also would like to thank the team behind the podcast, Juliana Wooden, Chris Kelman, and Jason Clayton. Take care, everyone.